Next case is Eggleston v. Wood. Uh, each part of that 15 minutes is under argument. In this case, you're the only person here. You will not have anything to rebut, so you just have your 15 minutes to argue okay. uh, at that point. Arguments are being recorded. When you come up, please stay by the podium. Introduce yourself. Uh, please speak in the voice so we can hear you. If you have need to refer to the child, please do so by initials, not the name of the child uh, in this matter. Having said that, the court's ready to brief and are ready to proceed whenever you come. Thank you, Your Honor. Ready? <laughs> May it please the court. My name is Rachel Smith, and I represent the appellee, or sorry, the appellant in this matter, Christian Wood, who is uh, the father of the minor child in this case. Um, the appellee is Jetta Eggleston, and she is the mother of this child. Um, the father and the mother had a very brief relationship, resulting in mother becoming pregnant with, uh, with this child. Father has wanted nothing more since learning from uh, learning about the pregnancy to be an integral part of this child's life. You can see this as it's reflected on the docket when father filed his uh, complaint to establish a parent-child relationship prior to the child's birth in uh, August of 2020. January of 2021, the child was born, and in May of 2021, father had filed his motion to establish his parental rights and responsibilities and also to establish a child support order. Mother filed for retroactive child support and birthing expenses. The parties conducted extensive discovery throughout the course of this case, particularly because father is an NBA player and he makes a significant amount of money. And mother was unemployed at the time, um, and was not necessarily allowing father time to see his child. However, throughout the entire course of this litigation, father paid mother child support by way of direct payment. Father provided for the child's day-to-day -day needs financially, buying him clothing, shoes, diapers, all of that is reflected in the trial testimony. The matter came to trial in April of 2023 and by December of 2023, the magistrate issued a decision ordering that father pays $25,000 per month in child support, retroactive to the date of the child's birth. Father timely objected to the magistrate's decision and he subsequently filed two separate motions for leave to plead to file a supplemental brief. And on January 18th of 2024, the court denied, defendants, or denied father's objection, saying that the objection was not timely filed. Father then subsequently filed a motion to vacate the trial court, outlining that according to the civil rules and the juvenile court rules, the objection was timely filed. The court never ruled on that, so in order to protect father's right to appeal the decision, father took the instant appeal in this action. As you can see, mother hasn't necessarily filed any response to the appeal. Father filed his appeal raising three assignments of error, and the first two essentially have to do with the into play of the, of the civil rules and the juvenile rules in regards to the timing of the sequence of filings. Now in this case, um, as it's detailed and outlined in our brief, the uh, trial court issued its decision on December 13th, and then they mailed it. Now under the civil rules and the juvenile rules, when a court does mail service, you get three extra days for serving by mail. The day of filing. Are we providing case law to prove that it's in the civil rules? And it's I understand, but I, I'm not aware of any cases that were interpreted that way in regard to an objection. Well, the, there are the rules that the date of filing of the order doesn't count, and then you get 14 days for right. the objection. But then the civil rules and the juvenile rules both state that the computation of time gets an additional three days for regular mail service, and there's a reason for that. Because if a judge issues an order, hands it to the clerk or file stamps it, it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't go anywhere until the next day. Now if you're filing email service, sure, you don't get those extra three days because you get service right away. Regular mail, you have to wait for the post office to deliver it to you. That's why you get those three extra days. And the date of filing, because nobody knows it's filed until they actually get notice that something's been filed, which goes out the next day or when the parties actually receive it. Now the juvenile court summarily dismissed father's objection saying that it was outside of the 14 day period, stating that it was filed one day late, completely ignoring the three extra days for regular mail service and completely ignoring that the first day that the date of the order is filed is not counted with the computation of time. 
if we exclude the three day rule for the moment and say that doesn't count, just giving you the one extra day, does that get you within the 14 day? Yes. How? how? It was. Start, start counting on day 14, right? It was. All right, so. The day of the decision was time stamped December 13th of 2023, which isn't included. So the days start to be counted from December 14th of 2023. Now, because he was served by regular U.S. mail, the additional three days are added to the calculation. So the first day upon which the calculation begins is December 17th, 2023. Well, okay. I, I, I asked, excluding the three-day rule. Yes. We'll exclude that for a moment. I'm very Just with the one day, did you make it within 14 days? Yes. So 14, 14 days. 14 days then would have been the 27th. Well, it extends it to 1231. I, I'm it, very it, bad it, at head math. So it takes away those three days. days. Yeah, so 31, 30, so December 29th. And we had filed our objection by the 28th. Okay. Now you also have to include that when a deadline falls on a Saturday or Sunday or a legal holiday, it rolls to the next day. Why is that? Because what nobody's the in the court when it's filed. What, what, what day is a legal holiday? 27th illegal or a court holiday? Well, so we had, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I didn't do my calculations with, with the three days excluded. Okay. So when you add the 14 days plus, the, it, it, it extends it to 1231, which is a Sunday. The next day is the New Year's holiday. All courts are closed. So it essentially means that the objection was due to be filed on January 2nd. And what day was it filed? It was filed December 28th. And that, and you can see in the magistrates, or in the trial court's order as well, it says that the order was due on, or the objection was due on the 27th. So it was filed one day late on the 28th. Then you have the second issue of the assignment of error where Father had filed two separate um, motions for leave to plead for the supplemental brief. Again, you have the civil rules and the juvenile rules both allowing for the initial objection to be filed, outlining the particular facts and issues of law that you are taking up on objection, and then filing a precipe or, or causing the transcript to be filed. That transcript needs to be filed within 30 days of the day that the objection was filed. Our objection was filed on the 28th. The transcript was filed on January 7th. That's within that 30-day window. Counsel, I guess I was a little confused with that. It seems to me, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but it seems to me that the only way you could succeed on assignment error number two is if you succeed on assignment error number one. In other words, if the objection was filed untimely, you can't supplement an untimely objection, right? Yes. Yes. So the court dismissed the objection, denied the first motion for leave, said nothing about the second motion for leave. And the law is very clear that you can get leave to plead so long as there is good cause shown. Well, in this case, particularly in consideration of the fact that trial was done, trial briefs were, were due by a certain date, father filed his trial brief on time, mother took 87 days to file her trial brief until the court notified mother that her trial brief needed to be filed, and then she finally filed it. Mother was given ample time to be able to correct any procedural or timing issues with her in relation to her filings, yet father isn't even granted a single which is particularly egregious, and what we argue is not only an abuse of the discretion, but plain air, because it's a misinterpretation of the applicable law, and it's a misinterpretation on its face, which affects the, the fairness of the judicial process, because it circumvents father's right to be able to object to this $25,000 a month child support order, which brings us to the last assignment of error, in that the trial court heard by ordering father to pay $25,000 per month in child support. Now, if you look at the facts of the case, it's clear that father was making quite a bit of money as a professional basketball player. He was making around $14 million in one period or in one year. 
mother was not working at the time, but she had a minimum wage imputed to her. Now, when you look at the income of the parties, and it exceeds that three hundred thirty-six thousand dollar and some change, three hundred thirty-six thousand four hundred sixty-seven dollars and four cents, that the court doesn't just look at the worksheet. The court has to look at the needs and the standard of living of the child who are the, who are the subject of the child support order, as well as that of the parent. Now, there is case law that further refines what the needs of a child are, and the needs of a child are necessities like food, clothing, shelter, medical care, and education. The testimony at trial was clear in that father not only supported his child's day-to-day -day needs prior to the child support being ordered, uh, prior to the temporary agreement of September while the case was pending, father had made direct payments to mother, $8,000 or so, sent money for diapers and food and clothing all throughout the child's life. In addition to that, he was paying $5,000 a month in temporary support. Now the testimony at trial, and we conducted an extensive discovery in this case, related to mother's actual child-related expenses. We had month by month of her bank accounts because that's what's necessary in order for her to get retroactive child support. She has to show that father failed to support his child during those months where there was not an actual child support order in effect. And we did show that. We went through each month of her bank statements, and she couldn't show a single month where she spent more than $1,000 on this child. In fact, the December 13th order even states that mother's uh, fixed expenses, her monthly expenses, are $5,000. Then why would the court issue an order for child support that is $20,000 more than both mother and the child's cumulative needs on a monthly basis. The, your client was certainly willing to indicate the testimony to pay various expenses for the child going forward. And he did. And, and he had. Things. Did the court order those to be paid by him at some point? I, I know we did the child support order and there's a rehabilitation order that followed. Did the court in any order say, yes, he shall pay these following expenses? No. The, the order is very, very short. Um, all that it says is father's income is this, mother's income is this, father has this extraordinary extravagant lifestyle, whereas mother lives within her means. Her means are essentially supported by child support because while the case was pending, mother bought a new house, bought a new car, didn't wasn't working, went back to school, which is wonderful for mother and an extension wonderful for the child, but how is that money going to the child? That is what child support is for. This is a child, not an investment opportunity. And in, in well, addition to... Well, let's, let's back up a little bit. One of the things is, I think that Judge Stevenson may be getting at is, he was under no obligation, legal obligation, to pay as much as he did for the outside expenses. Well, he is also obligated to pay for all of the travel expenses. In the event mother allows him to see his child. Well, that was my question. Were those yes. things specifically he, included yes, in any yes. orders? He'll pay he this pays expense for, expense. He pays for airfare. Mind you, he's also a professional basketball player. So there are certain months of the year where he's all over the country. So the visitation order was that mother would fly the child, father would pay for mother's ticket, pay for her car, pay for her hotel, pays for her rooming expenses, gives her extra spending money just to facilitate visitation to bring the child with him. And that's in the order? That's in the order. Okay, but what I was actually referring to was the other things you were speaking of, like paying for basketball camp, paying for uh, well, the child private was school, paying for all, yeah, all the yeah. things. So the the child was an infant at the time. I know, so I know but that's something that you camera. mentioned in your, in your brief. Yes, so but he, no, did, he did say he's more than willing to pay for I, that. I understand, but there's no legal obligation at this point. Uh, the court didn't put that in the order. As right, as so in other words, the $25,000 per month could be in lieu of all those things that he promised to do. But the, the, the child's needs and the support is supposed to be set on the child's current needs. Mm -hmm. Not in order to confer a future benefit for the child, not in order to support mother's lifestyle. It is not a spousal support order. We are not dividing income. We are not equalizing income between and the You're down to one minute left in your time, counsel. Okay, thank you. And I know that one of the arguments is that wife, not wife, mother, <laughs> But we've got too many divorce cases today. Mother was, um, he doesn't think mother is, is uh, spending the money on child. So he wants to be able to control how the money is spent, basically. 
No, not necessarily. He, he had no problem with covering all of the child's expenses and it said three to four thousand dollars a month of child support, which is enough to meet both mother and the child's expenses. But he's determining what time to he pays for the most of it. Because it's not no. a court order. He, well, would be mother has, he would be determining what would be paid for for the child, whether he wants to buy ten thousand dollars worth of jewelry for the child or if he wants to buy diapers for the child. Not necessarily because because mother is the person who has a child 100% of the time. Mother has $1,000 per month in expenses. Father is giving her $5,000 a month, five times more than what she needs, in addition to paying for absolutely everything for this child, including paying these expenses to facilitate visitation for himself. Not only paying for mother to fly from place to place, but paying for his own family members to go, retrieve the child, and bring it to him for his parenting time. That's really expensive, paying on a monthly basis. And that is an expense that mother doesn't have to partake in um, at any amount. Um, you, you ran over time there. Answer your question. That's fine. Sorry. If you brief, if you brief conclude, please. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, it's for these reasons that we ask that the trial, but that this court reverse and remand to the trial court with uh, with specific instructions on how to calculate child support uh, based on these facts, in addition to um, clarifying the procedural rules and the uh, improper dismissal at the time of the file objection. Thank you, Judge Vickery, for the presentation today on behalf of the court. The court takes the matter under advisement and issues a decision in due course. When that decision is released, it will be mailed to you by the clerk of courts and also be available on the High Supreme Court website.